the Agents of Liberty are a highly controversial regiment of the Astra Militarum thanks to their origins and choices. Every guard regiment fights for the Emperor, but the Agents fight for something more. They fight not just for the Emperor's people, but for human liberty. Though the Agents know their war of freedom versus autocracy is a losing one, they will wage it at any cost, for better or worse. A recently settled world called Battlement resides in the eastern fringes, which resemble a third millennium terror. Most would be forgiven for thinking Battlement didn't have a chance when the Tau came. Ever the masters of subversion, the Tau exacerbated Battlement's social, political and economic issues. They turned people against each other to a point where civil war was one riot away. Their industrial sabotage devastated Battlement's manufacturums and farms, forcing them to rely on the Tau for basic goods. Battlement's democracy was rigged to allow the Exalted Ones, a pro-Tau political party, to win key elections. Accusations of election meddling were dismissed by the Watercast, and those who came forward with said accusations mysteriously committed suicide in the following months. The Exalted Ones branded themselves as the solution to Battlement's problems and functioned as a puppet government for the Tau's interests. Over the next few years, the Exalted Ones persecuted any who refused to bend the knee, while giving a luxurious lifestyle to those who swore allegiance to the greater good. Battlement was trapped in a gilded cage. A man named Crispus Atticus, fed up with the Tau's increasing lies and oppression, formed a group called the Agents of Liberty on the continent of Mary Kay. He opened them up to anyone who wished to be free from the Tau Empire and planned a revolution. Tragically, he'd be killed by fire warriors at a rally he attended, but his death ignited their uprising. All of Mary Kay was consumed in a rebellion. The Agents of Liberty attempted a coup and seized the planetary governor's palace, the Pale Keep, in a costly siege. However, the Tau revealed their true strength that day. The Earthcast broadcast a lightning Tau assault involving battlesuits that annihilated the Agents. Across the world, these battlesuits overrun the Agents in minutes. In the rare instances of a hard-fought stalemate against Tau forces, battlesuits would bring these struggles to an ignoble end. The Agents of Liberty were rooted, and the battle suits seemed unstoppable. Facing total collapse, General Gregory Nashton took command of the Agents and sent them underground to regroup. Instead of open warfare, they'd use guerrilla tactics to make the Tau bleed. Highly fanatical or trained Agents were sent on cover raids to conduct heists, sabotage, assassinations and more. Those who survived these risky missions became potent commanders for the Rebellion. Ministorum priests fought watercast propaganda in hacked broadcasts to win back Guaversa who had lost their way, enduring dangers from the robust Earthcast surveillance system nicknamed Big Al Navar. Nashton himself made a distress call to a roaming freeblade in the eastern fringes, as his graviton gun and lightning cannon could devastate Tau battlesuits. He and his team arrived a month later, miraculously outrunning the Tau blockade. The amount of aircraft and AA units the agents sacrificed to escort the night made it a costly battle in its own right. Fire warriors and drones relentlessly attacked air bases and AA sites. Since the Agents of Liberty had inferior war gear, they had to hack and steal Tau equipment to compete on a tactical level. The Tau war effort was stunned, while the agents grew in size and strength thanks to their recruitment drives. The newly arrived knight demanded a hefty fee for his services, but his strength was worth its weight in gold. The Tau, though bloodied, were resourceful. They and the Exalted Ones increased nighttime raids to cripple the recruitment of additional rebels while conducting search and destroy missions on rebel supply routes. The Exalted Ones were used by the Tau as spies so they could dismantle the agents from within. The agents were still losing control of Mary Kay, albeit at a slower pace than before. This period consisted of many fighting retreats. By year five, things were bleak. The Tau's counterinsurgency took its toll, and eventually they were routinely storming bases and hideouts the agents inhabited. Rooted from their urban hideouts, the agents had to camp in a lethally frigid wasteland called Basin Forge. Even the Freeblade was severely damaged. 
All seemed lost, but one day an event transpired that every agent of liberty described as the Emperor's reward for their loyalty. A battle barge was shot down after an ill-fated space battle which sent drop pods from orbit. The Tau and agents raced to the crest site. When they found the wreckage, they found hundreds of armored, towering warriors. These Astartes had grey warplate with no insignias. Introductions were cut short when the Tau attacked the crash site. The agents themselves were exhausted and dwindled, but given new vigor when put alongside the Astartes. The Tau knew the potency of the Astartes and sent many hunter cadres to overrun the crash site, but they were repelled. Impressed, the Astartes requested the youngest agents undergo implantation to replace their losses. Those who survived to be Astartes would add their own culture and way of war to this Astartes chapter. The agents and fresh scout marines infiltrated bombed-out urban areas to discover a potent psycho cult called the Harbingers of Intrigue. Together, they killed the ravenous Kroot and Vespid patrols, and Harbingers pledged their aid. Thanks to the Astartes and a cult of potent psychers, the Rebellion had an ace in the hole. With their newfound alliance and resources, the Rebels began Operation Uprising. Aided by their new allies, the Rebels were to retake every tau held city and force them off battlement for good. The legitimacy of the Exalted Ones had to be eroded by exposing the Tau atrocities they facilitated, winning public favor for the Rebellion in the process. But even if the Tau were forced off battlement and their allies routed, their fleet could still wreak havoc from above. The defense lasers and starship great iron cannon and railgun emplacements had to be seized. The rebels made promising headway, but that came at a cost of collateral damage and civilian deaths, which nearly cost them public favor. The backlash forced them to protect civilians out of pragmatism, but this turned to genuine desire in the later years of the uprising. The Imperials also had deficiencies in their coordination, especially in the face of deadly Tau counter-offensives. Luckily, these challenges were overcome, and the rebellion gained momentum. They raided Aguavesa City, destroying the HQ of the Exalted Ones in a five-hour gunfight against many auxiliaries. Earthcast facilities nearby were hacked to globally broadcast proof of Tau atrocities. Another Astartes chapter, named the Void Paladins, covertly sent a Venator kill team to Battlement to help the rebels while secretly monitoring them for chaotic taint. Fifteen years later, victory was near. The Tau were unpopular, the Exalted Ones were illegitimate, and they lost control over most cities. A lone ethereal had just eight hundred cadres left, holed up in a fortress. Shasso Yoon, in his KX-139 supremacy armor, led this force. This desperate and surrounded Tau had a trump card. If defeated, their orbital fleet was to enact the reset protocol, a mass bombardment via Dark Star warheads. The Tau could reclaim a lifeless battlement with no resistance. Knowing the price of failure, the Freeblade Knight renamed himself Libertatum Primus and swore fealty to the rebels. He then helped to lead the most important campaign the Rebellion ever made. The Tau conceded the laser silos since they knew those lacked the strength to deter their fleet. The gun drones were swept aside, handing the Imperials an easy victory. Their next objective, the railgun batteries, faced heavier resistance. Battlesuits, crude, and hammerheads were present. Even Terminators sent to absorb enemy fire couldn't force a breach, and would have been wiped out if not for well-timed stealth attacks from the flanks. Only the iron cannons remained, and the ethereal realized the enemy's plan. The reset protocol would begin in 12 hours once his fleet got in range. The Imperials threw everything into the assault. The infantry faced mass drone swarms and the full wrath of the fire warriors and their allies. Battlesuits devastated enemy vehicles and terminators. Libertat and Primus faced Shazo Yoon in a titanic duel. The battle reaped an unimaginable toll for both sides, but terminators and commando teams broke through and seized the iron cannons. The Tau fleet was destroyed with seconds to spare. The surviving Tau and their allies were thrown from Valkyries thousands of feet in the sky as Battlement celebrated its hard-won freedom. Battlement saw 50 years of peace and prosperity. The Astartes, now mostly made up of former Agents of Liberty, called themselves the Emperor's Liberators. 
General Gregory Nashton shaped the agents into a fully professional force, whose tactics and organization reflected their experiences against the Tau. Their various infantry regiments would be trained in guerrilla tactics. They'd be complemented by mechanized infantry, Valkyries and the occasional formation of heavy armor. This was due to their experience in unconventional warfare, stealth and mobility, but it made wars of attrition and sieges much harder unless they were on defense. The agents wore red, white and blue uniforms. Their war gear has unique appearances resembling ancient Terran armies, but functions like their imperial counterparts. They also created an elite covert division called the Spectres. They're hardened veterans of dangerous missions, but were too old for Astartes' implantation. An operator in the Spectres dons unique black carapace armor with camouflage options and tactical gear. They utilize all the war gear veteran guardsmen can wield, along with a bolt or plasma pistol as a sidearm. Melee weapons range from knives to battle axes. Most operators preferred modified bolters or auto guns, though others chose Atchison pattern shotguns, hell guns, or other special weapons. Unique shock troops, called juggernauts, were physically imposing units whose war gear could influence firefights by themselves. The Spectres haunted mankind's foes from the shadows and won the deadliest wars, one covert raid at a time. Their prowess on the battlefield would be described by most enemies as supernatural hence their name. Gilliman's arrival marked the day the agents began their campaign to free the rest of the galaxy. They were sent to the nearby Krang system, a system besieged by Chaos and the Tau spheres of expansion. Their first campaign was at the behest of the Ordo Hereticus. A planetary governor decided to secede from the Imperium, deciding that their tithes were destructive to her world. The agents of Liberty weren't just employed because they were the closest regiment, however. The very name the agents made for themselves garnered suspicion of their loyalty in the Order of Hereticus, and this task proved a sort of test. For their part, the agents realized the implications of their mission and the price for disobedience, so they took as delicate an approach as possible. While their main forces sought to engage the governor's armies, they tried to evacuate the cities as much as they could. While some civilians complied, others turned hostile at their perceived oppressors and started a bloody urban conflict for a month. The collateral damage to buildings and civilians was severe. The spectres were ordered to storm the governor's palace and force a surrender. The operator swiftly killed her bodyguards, but the governor jumped to her death to avoid capture. When the war finally ended and the planet was reabsorbed, many of the agents who were deployed questioned if they were liberators or subjugators. Colonel Mitchell and a task force of agents respond to a distress call from the icy, Promethean-rich world of Alut. The Tau Fourth Sphere expansion led an uncharacteristically brutal siege that seized the capital city of Moors Point in record speed. The auxiliaries were deployed in mass wave assaults as a mask for sabotage missions by various stealth suits that decimated Imperial defenses. The PDF would be overrun without Mitchell and his agents of liberty to hold the line. They could only buy time against the inexorable Tau forces led by Shaso Jing as the Promethean refiners and cities continued to fall. Evacuating all the civilians from the overzealous Tau was a costly endeavor. At the 11th hour, 400 Astartes from the Emperor's Liberators arrived alongside Freeblade Knight Libertatum Primus and a Titan Legion. With heavy firepower and the Astartes by his side, Mitchell begins an 11-year siege of Moore's Point to liberate the city from Tau hands. The siege is apocalyptic in scale, with both sides using biological and chemical weapons. Libertatum Primus alone slew over a dozen various battlesuits before his knight was heavily damaged and required extraction. The Titans repeated a similarly victorious toll, but Manta gunships inflicted serious losses against them. Moore's Point was blasted to ruin by the time the Imperials retook the city. Alut's people endured famine and frostbite and began rioting to such a degree that the agents had to assume the unfamiliar role of occupier and enforce a martial law. The Imperials launched a failed counterattack on the Tau-held world of Middle Dominion, forcing the Tau to divert resources and stretch themselves thin. Facing defeat, Shaso Jing fires Darkstar warheads at Alut to cover his escape. 
The chasseur and his battlesuit don't get far, as he is killed by a vengeful Colonel Mitchell in his Baneblade. Segmentum Command also authorizes the use of Death Strike missiles on Middle Dominion, obliterating it in nuclear fire. A loot is secured, but most of its people and Prometheum are burned away in the fires of war. Over two-thirds of the deployed agents and liberators lay dead. The agents faced some setbacks. In Operation Crimson Wings, the Agents of Liberty deployed a four-man team of Spectres for deep reconnaissance on the world of Hotak. Tasked with locating and disrupting Chaos Cult activity, they were detected by local citizens and attacked from all sides by Chaos Cults on the mountainous planet. All but one Spectre were killed, and the Valkyrie full of Spectres sent to rescue them was shot down with no survivors. The wider Agents of Liberty deployed to the world to recover their dead and destroy the local Chaos Cults in force, enduring heavy losses in the subsequent battles. Luckily, one surviving Spectre, named Marcus, was found seriously wounded in a nearby village. After Marcus was recovered, the Agents launched multiple offensives in the mountains where cult activity was found, spending the next three months engaging these elusive foes until Hotak was finally secured from the Chaos Cults. The Spectres took the lead in said offensives, eager for vengeance against the cults. In the disastrous battle known as Fallen Valkyrie, the Spectres were deployed to the world of Mogad on a routine mission to covertly dismantle a Chaos Cult. While en route, a Valkyrie was shot down by rockets. Another Valkyrie sent in to rescue the downed operators was also shot down. The first crash site had two survivors who held their position until the wider agents of Liberty extracted them, but the second crash site witnessed disaster. The group there was overrun after hours of repelling cultist mobs, leaving only one surviving operator that was taken prisoner. His comrades were paraded on the streets, while the prisoner was sacrificed in a ritual. The agents fought in an engagement adopted the malicious mile, which saw them battling through a mile of roads to rescue their troops and later evacuate Mogat entirely. The Spectres and the agents took severe casualties, while several Chaos Warlords took over Mogat for themselves. Lastly, the jungle world of Fetan saw its population highly receptive to the Watercast, rebelling against the Imperium. The agents were deployed against the Vita and Guevesa, but the two sides employed similar tactics. Neither side would give in, but the tide turned when the aircast destroyed the nearby Imperial fleet and blockaded Vitan. The agents were held out for 15 years before finally being wiped out by the local Guevesa and Tau reinforcements. Despite these losses, the agents refused to leave the sector at the mercy of the Watercast and Chaos Cults. The opportunity for payback presented itself on the world of Kafract, a world besieged by chaos. Upon arrival, the agents found a ragtag army of soldiers already engaging the traitors. This army was unusually efficient and fought highly conservatively. However, they were extremely anxious and uneasy around the agents, insisting that the agents identify themselves. When the agents complied, the unknown army felt relief. If any Imperial force would show them mercy and clemency, it would be the regiment called the Agents of Liberty. The army said they came from a region called the Severan Dominate and ended up in the eastern fringes thanks to a war prift. They were secessionists from the Imperium, fed up with its tyranny. They questioned why the Agents, a regiment of freedom fighters, served a tyrannical Imperium. The agents retorted by asking why the Severan served Duke Severus, a dictator who betrayed all his promises. Arguments over who truly fought for freedom were interrupted by a renewed chaos offensive that threatened multiple hives. The agents and Severans agreed to a truce, fighting tooth and nail to repel the siege. The agents led decapitation strikes, while the Severans mounted a stalwart defense against the chaos hordes, and both units staged raids against the enemy's rear lines. Libertatum Primus was deployed, and together with Duggan anti-tank infantry, formed bulwark against traitor Baneblades. The Chaos Offensive was halted until Imperial reinforcements arrived. The Agents and Severans had a newfound respect for each other, reaching an understanding that both armies fought for human liberty. Such a bond was cut short when the Inquisition arrived and arrested the Severans for treason. The loss of such allies embittered the agents, but the incident made certain parties suspicious of their regiment.
As the war for the Krang system intensified, the High Lords sent the Death Corps of Krieg, Morden Irongard, Katakan jungle fighters, and Valhallen Ice Warriors as reinforcements. The Death Corps were deployed alongside the Agents of Liberty on the world of Drassus against the Orcs, and it was nearly a disaster. The Agents fracked numerous Krieg officers, refusing to obey suicidal orders. Krieg commissars executed so many rebellious agents that their bolt pistols ran out of ammo. The Death Corps condemned the lax discipline, seditious beliefs in freedom and anti-authoritarianism of the agents, branding them chaos cultists with aquiles. The agents in turn dismissed the Death Corps as a callous and wasteful regiment devoid of common sense. They couldn't agree on tactics or objectives in battle either. The agents employed guerrilla tactics while the Death Corps insisted on wars of attrition. While the Death Corps relentlessly sought to break fortified positions, the agents prioritized defending civilian populations. This cost the agents even more losses and extended the length of the campaign. It took five years amid dysfunction and hostility among the two regiments before Drassus was secure from the Orcs. Similar incidents plagued the agents when serving alongside the Mordens and Valhallens on other worlds. The inability of the agents to overcome differences with other regiments proved disastrous. Things finally changed for the better when the agents met the Catacans on Dragon V. Dragon V was occupied by the Dark Mechanicum and its adamantium couldn't fall to their hands. While there was some distrust between the two regiments at first, they'd end up getting along famously. The Catacans were pleasantly surprised when these newcomers in tactical gear were adept at stealth and ambush tactics. Both armies fought like ghosts, an unseen menace that struck without warning or remorse. Entire armies of traitor guardsmen were methodically wiped out. Dragon V was retaken in two weeks. Such was the ruthless efficiency and synergy that they possessed. The Catacans would nickname the agents the Candicate Killers as a jest at their color scheme and a sign of respect. They serve alongside each other again in the world of Avalon against the Tau incursion. While the Tau were delayed by ambushes in Avalon's cities, the agents and Catacans seized Watercast broadcast hubs. The agents broadcast their ideology on a Vox program called Information Warrior. The populace then rose up in arms against Tau forces. It was enough to fully repel the Tau while proofing Avalon's people against Watergast subversion. It would work a little too well. The Ordo Hereticus followed the drama unfolding in the Krang sector closely. An Ordo Hereticus Inquisitor named Jackson Dorsek was fond of regiments like the Death Corps and did great exception to those who had slighted them. He also took the accusations of heresy against the Agents of Liberty seriously, as Dorsic had a similar distrust of the regiment. As the years went on, he became an outspoken critic of both the Agents and their Astartes counterparts, the Emperor's Liberators. Things finally reached ahead when Avalon was suddenly plunged into rebellion. The rebel leaders sought to break free from the tyranny of the Imperium, and this movement rapidly gathered recruits. Jackson Dorsick had studied the Agents of Liberty enough to know that it was them who inspired this rebellion, and he had enough to build his case. In the meantime, he ordered the Destroyers of Worlds to crush the rebellion. The rebels adopted many aspects of the Agents of Liberty, like their naming conventions and tactics. The Astartes were brutally efficient in their assaults, employing terror raids to frighten any would-be rebels into compliance. The rebellion was vanquished in three weeks, and the suppression efforts were so effective that the populace turned against the rebels just to stay the wrath of the destroyers of worlds. This led to the Inquisition charging the agents of liberty with heresy, citing numerous complaints against the regiment and the Avalon rebellion that the agents inspired. Jackson Dorsick represented the many monodominant inquisitors who wanted the agents excommunicated and destroyed. Fresh outrage came when the Ordo Hereticus obtained copies of Independence, M2776 and M2984, texts that the Agents of Liberty studied religiously. Radical Inquisitors ridiculed the idea that the Agents could be heretics. They pointed out how the Agents went to great lengths to save civilians. They named Chaos the Great Tyrant and the Tau the Blue Menace. They also claimed that their experience against the Tau was essential. 
Their beliefs were peculiar, not heretical, and the agents could be a great asset if used properly. Their Spectre division in particular aided the Ordo Xenos in many assassinations of high-ranking Tau. The Puritans, however, would not be denied, claiming that the temporary usefulness of the agents would be outweighed if they were allowed to survive and inevitably turn traitor. Informed of the charges against them, many agents of liberty were enraged. They questioned why the Imperium spat upon their sacrifices with false accusations. Feeling betrayed, a colonel named Robert Edward gathered one third of the agents to secede from the Imperium. They hijacked nearby void ships before fleeing to the Novum Sector to start anew. When the Inquisition received news of this secession, they gave the agents an ultimatum. Destroy their traitorous comrades or be excommunicated. Colonel Edward sent his newly captured fleet to the agri-world of Briggs, eager to create a new and truly free domain for humanity. He absorbed the local PDF and repelled attacks by the Arbites and Tempestus Scions. Another Agents of Liberty Colonel, nicknamed the Snapping Turtle, was ordered to lead a detachment to put down the rogue guardsmen. Upon arrival, Colonel Snapping Turtle begged Colonel Edward to stand down. He'd make it look like the rebellion was crushed to satisfy the Inquisition, but in reality Edward's troops would be peacefully returned to the Agents and given full clemency. Colonel Edward refused. Citing an unknown source, Edward claimed that the Inquisition massacred hundreds of Astartes on Armageddon for simply questioning an exterminatus decision. Even their chaptermaster was assassinated years later. Edward pointed out that if the Inquisition murdered Astartes for petty grudges, then guardsmen accused of sedition fared no better. Edward finished by proclaiming that if the Agents of Liberty were to keep their name, they could no longer serve the Imperium. The Inquisition could not be trusted or placated. Diplomacy broke down, and trusted comrades turned on each other in a horrific war. The secessionists initially made great headway, especially against many agents who were still reluctant to kill their former comrades. Secessionists Major George, confident of imminent victory, ordered his forces to charge against the supposed weak point against the agents of liberty. The assault, infamously known as George's Charge, was a disastrous advance into a ridge that killed most of his forces in a single day. The agents capitalized on the enemy's misfortune, destroying them in short order. Bonds that lasted for decades were burned away in a war that killed 900,000 agents and secessionists. Scarred by this internecine war, the survivors left the war-torn world of Briggs. The detachment of agents who just survived the war barely had time to rest and process what had just happened when they were called to war yet again. They were once again tasked by the Inquisition with bringing a secessionist world to heal to prove their loyalty. At this point, the force of agents had snapped. To them, the secessionist comrades were right the entire time. They'd been the puppets of a dictatorship and were unworthy of their name as long as they served the Imperium. Upon landing onto the planet of Indari, the agents went rogue and supported the rebels. The inquisitorial forces who deployed with the agents were quickly slaughtered. The agents on the ground tried and failed to contact the Empress Liberator's chapter, for they were busy elsewhere. The only other force in the galaxy supposedly sympathetic to the values of freedom and independence were the traitorous Blood Gorgon's warband. They accepted the call, eager to expand their warband and territory. The invading Mordian Iron Guard were mauled by vicious guerrilla attacks from the agents and blood gorgons. When faced with little progress after ten years, the Imperials called in the brutal Graven Souls chapter. These White Scar successors employed terror tactics that disintegrated the rebellion in mere weeks. Most evacuation attempts were shut down by the Imperial blockade. Only a few dozen blood gorgons and a thousand rogue agents of liberty escaped. The rest were wiped out. Portions of the Agents of Liberty and Empress Liberators were returning to Battlement to resupply and spend time with their families as per their custom. These detachments were tragically unaware of many things. Whether it was the recent events that marked them as renegades, the presence of a word-bearer cult summoning demons on world, or the existence of a Grey Knight who noticed the invasion and arrived to assist. The demonic incursion was difficult to suppress, but it was nothing compared to when the Grey Knights began purging the population after the demons were banished. 
To the Grey Knights, it was a standard purging operation following a campaign. To the agents and liberators on the ground, it was a psychic Astartes chapter murdering their people. A brief but bloody skirmish erupted before the Grey Knights left Battlement, reporting the incident to the Inquisition. Battlement's finest had now incurred the wrath of the Inquisition. They'd been repaid with a relentless invasion by 750 marines from multiple chapters, thousands of sororitas, and three million of Astroian firstborn. Multiple inquisitors, who were longtime rivals of the liberators and agents, led the charge. Battlement cities were burned to the ground along with its inhabitants. The liberators and agents were slaughtered in countless ambushes as they tried to evacuate even a fraction of the population. A brief respite in the fighting allowed the inquisitors to lay out their terms. The emperor's liberators would forsake their treacherous values and endure a 500-year penitent crusade, while the agents of liberty became a penal legion. Battlement's defenders chose death instead of servitude to a tyrant. Spectre teams defended an underground bunker that housed Battlement's leadership. They held their own against the Tempestus signs, but the intervention of sororitas and Astarte soon overwhelmed the Spectres. Only the capital city remained, and defeat seemed inevitable. But the agents and liberators of World got word of the invasion, and ships from the liberators brought reinforcements. Freeblade Libertatum Primus led a desperate push to relieve their besieged comrades, despite the fierce rearguard by the Inquisition's forces. When the dust settled, it was revealed that the lead Inquisitor was possessed by a demon and persuaded to act on his disdain for the Liberators and agents. Unfortunately, they weren't blameless in their excommunication thanks to their prior actions. Battlement would have little time to recover from their invasion. The Bloodborne Wolf's War Band capitalized on Battlement's weakened state and launched an all-out raid to secure the Liberator's Gene Seed. The agents and Liberators stopped some of the Gene Seed from being stolen, but their fleet was too damaged to pursue the rest. Luckily, the nearby Stormbreaker's chapter was tracking this war band and managed to retrieve the Gene Seed after multiple vicious boarding actions. They returned the Gene Seed as a sign of trust and friendship. The Agents of Liberty, despite recent losses, would never relent in the war for mankind's freedom. They'd risk everything for the Empress people, especially in the face of the encroaching darkness, but their enemy now included a vengeful Inquisition. The Empress Liberators and Agents of Liberty would have to fight together from now on, but they would have it no other way.